As a person who makes videos on YouTube.com, I am always striving to look for ways to make easy content for more views. How do you do that? Well, there are a lot of different methods such as starting drama, defamation, etc. But the easiest and most legal way to do it is to have opinions that people don't like. Or maybe they do like. Be as polarizing as possible. No in-betweens. Those things never succeed in the market, and this stands true for Persona games as well. People only want definites and absolutes. And if you don't agree with me, the authority on all opinions ever, I will rain hellfire upon you! That's right everyone, it's hot take time. These are some opinions on the Persona series that I think people probably aren't going to like. Regardless of how you feel about them, be sure to leave a comment telling me your thoughts. Not because I actually care, but because I want that sweet algorithm boost. Sorry, that's just how the YouTube business works. This kinda goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for the Persona series throughout this video. This is your only warning. First hot take. You ever run into one of those Doomer type fans? Man, it's so hard being a fan of this game I like. Not because people harass me for liking it, not because there aren't any fans like me to talk about it with, but because it's not the most popular one! No, your favorite Persona game is not underrated. Unless your favorite game is Eternal Punishment. Those fans have my condolences. In the case of most Persona games though, they all sold pretty well. Look, I know, nobody wants to give Persona 1 a chance, they just accept the opinions of randos online and take advice from them. They just use the manga as a substitute without even really thinking about it, which is honestly kind of hilarious considering how much the Persona fans just hate reading. But if you look at the bigger picture here, I wouldn't go as far to say that Persona 1 is underrated. It sold the second best out of all the mainline Persona games in its initial sales. I think the real issue here is that we're way past Persona 1's heyday. That game came out before I was even a fetus. Every game had its time in the limelight, and yes, that includes your favorite game. You just weren't there when it happened. But then why are Persona 3 and 4 still popular then? It's likely a generational thing. A lot of Persona fans are young adults who grew up during the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube era such as myself. Some of them grew up with a PSP or a Vita, so we can come back to those games real easily. Hell, I can come back to some Super Nintendo games without much problem. Dragon Quest 1 for the NES though? Yeah, no, that's a once and done thing. Never doing that again. It's not gonna be like that forever though, make no mistake. There are already Persona 5 fans who can't finish or even refuse to play Persona 3 and 4 because PS2 games are too archaic for their standards. We'll be in the same boat as Persona 1 and 2 fans soon enough. That's the other thing though. Most of the early die-hard Persona 1 and 2 fans who were there when the games were actually popular, are probably a lot older than the Zoomer 1 and 2 fans. They either stopped caring about the popularity of their games, or just don't want to interact with little babies who think they're mature because they played Innocent Sin or whatever. I don't know. Then there's the topic of your favorite game receiving a lot of hate. Believe me, I've seen some pretty unhinged hate towards all the games. I've played all of them. Each game has their dedicated audiences as well as their dedicated haters. Which brings me to my next point. The Persona games that you hate are not overrated. Like, honestly, I don't think calling something overrated is really saying much of anything. The only vibe I'm getting from it is that you're bothered by other people's enjoyment of it. Something I try to avoid like the plague when I'm being critical of games is calling them overhyped or overrated. The implication of that always seems to be that the praise the game earns is unearned or undeserved. That's just dumb, because neither you nor me decide at what point does a game deserve someone else's respect. I'm not saying the way I critique games is perfect, but when I don't really think a game is all that, I just address the issues that I take with it and explain why I might think other games do it better. I always make it a point that there ain't anything wrong with liking games that I'm critical of. The thing that people in this take and the last take have in common is they both like to act like they're so oppressed, like, People aren't validating my opinion enough. It's so hard being me. Listen, 
I've been in both of these camps before. I'm no victim. I'm not expecting people to validate my opinions. I just expect them not to be a dick about it, you know? Anyone who can't agree to disagree with you can GET bent. If you want my opinion, the Persona games are all pretty evenly rated. If your concern is that there's too much blind praise over these games, and that the fans aren't capable of being critical of, like, anything, that is also wrong. Most people who don't like the games are probably just not talking about the games that they don't like. Go figure. Or maybe they already said their piece on it and have moved on. I know not everyone has the benefit of posting their thoughts on YouTube to be there forever and never needing to talk about it again. But hey, no use obsessing over what other people enjoy. Plenty of fans are open to talking about their personal qualms with these games, even their favorites. I'm gonna need you to listen real careful here, okay? They just don't agree that it's bad like you. I know, that's a real shock to you. Sometimes you just gotta accept that you're in the minority on some things, whether you're in favor or not in favor of said thing. God knows I have. Speaking of which, here's another thing that I seem to be in the minority on. I touched on it a little bit in my Innocent Sin video two years ago, but I think I'd like to elaborate more on it here. So, spoiler alert, Jun is the Joker. No, not that Joker. This Joker. Now, Joker actually has an interesting backstory. So, little baby Jun and Tatsuya were childhood friends along with the others, right? Long story short, he became evil because he remembered something about their childhood incorrectly and thinks Tatsuya, Lisa, and Ikichi killed Maya. This, in combination with the rumors becoming reality, warped his mind and transformed him into the rumored Joker as a result. That is a backstory. But the moment Jun comes back to his senses and joins your party, all of that just kinda goes away. He doesn't do anything interesting. The most we see of Jun is in flashbacks and the one or two things he did as Joker. We know what he did before the story, but he doesn't do anything during it. From my understanding, the main appeal of this character is that you can ship him with Tatsuya. I use the term ship very loosely. It's mainly just one dialogue choice that decides who Tatsuya likes and some description text during demon negotiation when you pair the two characters together. For any of my very astute viewers, you may remember I made a video covering Megami Tensei strategy guides. On one of the pages, I showed the guide for Persona 4. There's an interview where Atlas basically confirms that Jin was meant to appeal to girls who like BL, not for LGBT people. It's kinda shallow, but I mean, if you ship it, that's fine. I'm not trying to say that anything Fujoshi is inherently bad, it just kinda irks me how people will rant about how modern Persona fails so hard at being progressive, and they point to Persona 2 Innocent Sin as some sort of model to be followed, largely just because of this character. If you took the shipping factor away from him, I don't think people would go nearly as nuts over Jun. So in conclusion, Jun is a very deep and complex character. You wanna know what drives me nuts though? When people complain about how anime modern Persona is, how the games are filled with so much icky fanservice and etchy humor. Newsflash, the old Persona games were like that too. We were just talking about Jun, he is literally wish fulfillment for girls. They also make gay stereotype jokes, women can't drive jokes, booby jokes, as well as... Oh no! Persona, as well as all of Megami Tensei, has always been anime-inspired. Those were just more akin to what anime was like at the time. Persona 1 and 2 are what anime was back then. Persona now is what anime is today. They didn't become anime, it just changed alongside it. Anime has always been changing, and so it follows that Persona will follow suit. There will always be a degree of wish fulfillment in Persona, and while not every game may go as hard as Persona 4 levels of wish fulfillment, you can't deny that it's in the other games, it's pretty apparent. Alright, so this next one is gonna be pretty spicy. You should pledge to my Patreon. Uh, okay, that's not really Persona related, but hear me out. I would love to make more in-depth, longer videos like my Digital Devil Saga and Persona 4 videos. They take a while to make though. 
That Persona 4 video took me months. Not only because the game is long, but also because I had to keep the videos coming out in the meantime. If I didn't have to worry about keeping up my momentum and chasing algorithms, I could focus all my attention on one project instead of needing to split my concentration between several side projects. There's also the topic of YouTube's ever-changing terms of service. My videos have not been touched as of yet, but that can easily change on the flip of a dime. If you're not able to or don't want to donate, that's perfectly fine. The next best way to support me is just by watching the videos when they come out. Either way, pledge or don't pledge, thank you. Back to Persona. For those of you not in the know-how, in Persona 1 and 2, all characters could change personas, not just your protagonist. There were some limitations to it though. Characters could only take on personas that they are compatible with. This is determined by what Arcana the Persona is and what Arcanas the character is able to use. This is a cool concept. It means the entirety of the game can be focused mostly around a static party of characters. Why bother having more characters than you need when all of them can equip different personas and fill a specific role in your party? A lot of new fans going back to play the old games are fond of this concept and want to see the Persona series return to it. I disagree. Party members should stick to their designated personas. Allow me to explain. While the old Persona system was neat, it suffers from a few flaws that I think hold back the gameplay experience in the long run. Firstly, it's too flexible. Sure, there are restrictions to what a character can or cannot use, but even then, there's so much variety and cross-compatibility to the point where it barely matters. Part of the fun in RPGs, for me personally, is specking your party. Whether it be your demon build or selecting the best equipment for the job, it makes you adjust and strategize based on your current circumstances and your character's inherent abilities. A margin of flexibility is available, but those options aren't made immediately available to you and are not immediately apparent. It's left to the player to work things out. Secondly, it puts less value on the protagonist from a gameplay perspective. The only difference between the main character and the rest of the gang in the older games is your stat distribution being objectively better than everyone else's. Vitality and magic are king. In the newer games, the protagonist is able to fill any big or small niche role you need, because you're either building your party around the protagonist's setup, or you're building your protagonist based on what the rest of your party doesn't have. If they do revisit the idea of everyone being able to use multiple personas, I think they should approach it in a similar way to the Persona Q games. In those games, every character has a main persona determining their base stats, resistances, and skills, and a sub-persona that augments their arsenal. There's no arcana restrictions, but it'll be pretty obvious what personas will be good on what characters purely based on whether they're more physical or magic-leaning. Of course, in order to prevent a bloated cast of characters where some are just obviously more powerful than the rest, you could limit the main cast to just five characters, like the older games. A character's inherent strengths are still a major factor for your strategy, but you're still given a lot of freedom in terms of building off of that. Just don't make certain personas too powerful like in the Q games. But again, I'd rather they just stick with party members having one persona that gets stronger throughout the game. Okay, let's talk enhanced re-releases. They should stop doing that. That is my biggest hope for Persona 6 above all else. I first got into Persona when the original Persona 5 was still pretty new, but I actually chose not to play it. Why? My first Persona game was Persona 3 Fess. As I looked deeper into the series, I noticed Persona 4 also had an extended version called Persona 4 Golden. I immediately saw a pattern and knew that Atlas would eventually do something similar with Persona 5. So instead of playing Persona 5 right out of the gate, I decided to just wait for Persona 5 Royal. I'm sure I'm not the only person who caught on to this. It's because of this that I didn't experience Persona 5 until 3 years after its initial release. I didn't want to buy the same game twice, especially if they both ended up being on the same console. Don't get me wrong, the additions they added in Persona 5 Royal are great. It was totally worth waiting for. But the problem with these re-releases is that they devalue the original game. 
Royal was worth it for me largely because I never played the original. Most people who played the original will say the original is not worth going back to after playing Royal. When Persona 6 gets some grand announcement for its release, I shouldn't feel reluctant to buy it knowing that they're just going to release a better version of the game in two or three years. And for anyone who played the original, they're basically going to have to play through most of the same game all over again just to experience a few more hours of new content. That's kind of whack. I know enhanced versions of games have been a thing for a while, but at this point in time, it feels like such an archaic way to repackage and sell the same thing to your audience again. Say what you will about Kingdom Hearts 3, but at least that series was nice enough to finally drop the final mix trend and just provide patches to fix everything. And instead of releasing a whole new game for extra story and cutscenes, they waited about a year and sold it as DLC. I would say this should be the way to go from now on, but given Atlas's terrible track record with DLC, I'd rather not get anything. Okay, this next one might actually make people think I'm insane. Do you remember Strega from Persona 3? The antagonists of late aren't the worst by any means, but I think we need to shake things up again. I think they should make another Strega. I know what you're thinking. Strega? Those guys were so underwhelming, why would you want them to try that again? Takaya and Jin were definitely lacking in character development. Especially Jin, it's basically non-existent. What I think they did get right with Strega is that they were a good antithesis to the main cast. They posed existential and philosophical questions on the main cast. While Strega didn't pose a direct threat to the world, they welcomed the destruction of it. What if we did that again, but flesh out the antagonists more, like the way they did with Chidori? Give them a bit more presence throughout the story, flesh them out more, and make them more challenging to fight. Please. And to be extra clear, what I am not asking for is another ragtag group of one-off villains like Innocent Sin's Mask Circle. I know I've been pointing my finger at this game a lot, but I swear, it is just a breeding ground for Twitter user and Redditor ideas that I just don't think will fix Persona. This next one is pretty important because I know it applies to me as well. I know a lot of fans love their Persona YouTubers. They make good content and offer their own personal perspectives on the games they play. But you should not look to them as authorities on, like, anything. I know a lot of people like to use YouTube reviews as a means to get a good grasp on whether they should buy a game or not. Money is valuable, only spend it on things you really want, you know? However, I think people give us internet personalities too much credit. Like, come on now, don't put so much weight on the advice of anonymous strangers on the internet. Especially when it comes to what games you should spend your money on. This is a parasocial relationship thing. YouTube man is just a guy on your screen giving his opinions. If you want a genuine recommendation on the game, you should probably leave that to a close friend who knows your preferences really well. The only video where I ever urge people to play a game was my Devil Survivor video, and that was more because of the 3DS eShop closing than anything else. Most of my videos aren't even really about whether I would recommend the game to you, or whether they're worth playing. Most of you watching these videos are adults. You can decide for yourself what video games you should or shouldn't play. Don't pass on a game just because I said I didn't like it. I hate when people do that. If it's someone with a somewhat sizable following, then that's probably the mindset a lot of them are going to have. Now, I don't personally blame people who have less than favorable opinions on games for deterring people from playing them. Nor do I personally take responsibility for anyone who looks at one of my videos and decides, well, I guess this game is doo-doo, time to never play it. You have every reason to be skeptical of what I say. If it sounds too good to be true, or too awful to be real, then that's all the more reason for you to form your own opinion on said thing. The reason I even care about this so much is because it genuinely kind of pisses me off when people jump onto the bandwagon of relentlessly shitting on something when they didn't even play the game, or when people will shift their attitude on a game that they were pretty neutral on before just because they watched a negative video. Understand that people like me are just trying to share their opinions and not trying to tell you how to think. That's never been the point of any of my videos. 
which is why I'm kind of reluctant to really call my stuff reviews, but I stick with it due to a lack of a better term. I'm not here to recommend anything or scientifically quantify the quality of something, just share my experiences. Alright, now this last one is probably the most important one on the list, which is why I saved it for last. If you're a fan of Persona, it's okay not to like SMT. So, as we know, Persona is only one branch of the entire Megami Tensei franchise. With a franchise this expansive, consisting of many different series both long and short, it makes sense that some people would be more partial towards some games than others. We're all guilty of it. I will always encourage fans of Persona to try out the other games that Megami Tensei has to offer. Despite how different the games are from each other, they do share a lot of DNA and are enjoyable in their own regard. However, if you gave Shin Megami Tensei a fair shot and didn't enjoy it, that's fine. There seems to be this common assumption that if someone likes Persona but not SMT, they either didn't play it or they're just mad because bad. A similar assumption is sometimes made with people who like the newer Persona games but not the older ones. No, I'm pretty sure it's just not for them. If they say SMT's bad, they're obviously wrong but I can't hold it against them for not enjoying it. Persona is a series about taking your time, day by day, and appreciating the presence of the people in your life. SMT is about how people suck and will ultimately be the cause of their own doom. Same goes for the opposite. If you're a die-hard SMT fan and you just can't get into Persona, that's understandable. You don't want to read a million dialogue boxes worth of text in the course of 80 hours. That's not your ideal experience, I get it. As someone who enjoys both, I realize that not every subset of Megami Tensei is for everyone. On one hand, it's a little strange how when it comes to series like Pokemon, while not all fans of the mainline games are fans of the spin-offs, the spin-off fans are probably fans of the mainline games. But the same can't be said of Megami Tensei. It's part of the reason why I think Soul Hackers 2 was made the way it was. It was likely an attempt to find a sweet spot between the two. However, I think I realize the reason for that now. It's because unlike other series, there is no single mainline series in Mega Ten anymore. Persona is just too big of a behemoth to be considered just a spin-off. There are two dominant sects of Mega Ten now, Shin Megami Tensei and Persona. No other sub-series of Megami Tensei even comes close to having as many games as the big two. Although, most Megami Tensei spin-offs take more after SMT than Persona. The only important thing though, is that we acknowledge that these two things can coexist with each other. They thrive off each other, and add way more personality to the monster collecting genre. So there's no real reason to feel like they don't belong together. In the end, you might not have found anything I've said to be remotely controversial, there's also the possibility you want to rip my head off or something I said. Now that I'm really thinking about it, I don't think anything I've said was really that important. I'm not sure why I'm even making this right now. I guess the real point I wanted to get across in this video is, well, cope. <laughs>